This is Greg Trotwine with Maritime Reporter TV, and we're very pleased to be joined by Captain Morgan McManus, the master of SUNY's new maritime uh, training ship. So Captain McManus, to start us off, can you provide a brief career biography discussing your maritime pa uh, path plus insights on your position today? Hey, Greg, thanks for having me. So uh, when, once I graduated school, I started sailing. Uh, I sailed on license in the beginning as an AB. I started working on tankers, and then I sailed as a mate on tankers for a while, for a couple of years. Um, I decided to try out shoreside for a bit. I worked as a tanker broker for a couple of years, trying that out. And then I realized shoreside life wasn't for me, and I went back deep sea after that and been sailing deep sea for the last you know, 15, 20 years, um, about 10 years ago, I jumped over in the oil and gas industry, started working on the deep water drill ships, wanted to try that out. And that took me right up until before taking the, uh, the job at uh, SUNY Maritime in 2019. You know, as you know better than I, the mission to design, build, and deliver the series of national security multi-mission vessels has created a lot of excitement in the U.S. maritime sector. Can you tell us specifically your role has been in this program as it has developed and specifically any put any input you've provided during the design and construction of the first ship, Empire State 7. So when I joined the, the college in 2019, they were, they were in, still in the phases of designing it and uh, review. Herbert Engineering, the, the Naval Art Firm, and Marad were uh, getting inputs from all the SMAs of what was important, how the ship should be designed. And since it was being designed from the ground up to be a training ship, they sought a lot of input from all the SMAs into you know, how classrooms should be laid out, the birthing areas, right down to the, the mess deck design. Um, so, you know, they, they definitely got a lot of our input from all the schools to of how the ship should be built and what it should look like and what was needed. You know, we tried to say what we thought we needed to make a training ship a training ship. And uh, from your perspective, then, what, what has been the biggest challenge to getting this ship built and delivered? Uh, the biggest challenge, and I think everyone would agree, it's first. First in class, first in design, you know, first time being tried, first time a, a, a ship of this type is being designed from the ground up to be built. So throughout every bit of the process, there's always discovery of, of well, you know, we thought this was a good idea and then we started building and we realized that, okay, we got to tweak this and tweak that. So, so I think that's been, that's been a big part of it. The other part, and we've all forgotten, you know, the construction of this started, COVID was going on. So that made it difficult as far as meetings and, and project review. I mean, a lot was done by Zoom and Teams meetings and, you know, the yard was doing everything they could to, to keep work going. But, you know, it was that made it challenging as well. So you were trying to build a first in class ship with a pandemic going on. And, you know, um, that that had some impact on things. But re really, it's the first, you know, and that's the, the growing pains of the first in class. So that's the biggest thing. So when you look at this ship, what do you consider to be the top few systems or technical specifications that truly make it stand, uh, stand out? So I think, and, and it's it's funny because uh, the engineering side of it is, is what I'm amazed by, and I think it's great. You know, it's it's a diesel electric power plant. Um, it's built with redundancy of having uh, two engine rooms, you know, with two diesel generators in each engine room going to your, your two hot your dual high voltage switchboards, your dual propulsion motors. So, you know, it's built from a redundancy for the safe return to port feature, um, but it also helps for training because we'll be able to take off equipment 100% offline for teaching and then have it back online. But I think more importantly, I think our graduates, especially the engineering students are gonna get such a great um, working knowledge of power management systems and the, the computerization of the machinery and how reliant, not reliant but how integral computer software is to engine management and power management. And that's something that they're going to see more and more when they get out in the industry, whether it's working on a supply vessel, a deep water drill ship or modern, you know, ocean going vessels, power management has become a big part of it. So I think it's going to help them. And even when they go shore side, they're going to work with those type of systems if they're working in generating stations. So I think our engineers are going to get a lot of great training out of it, you know, with a modern vessel. Um, on the deck side, the cadets, you know, the dual bridge, we have a separate training bridge now from the main bridge. So we can, we get more interaction going on with more students. And that makes a big difference. Um, you know, the ship has a bow and stern thruster. So the, the, the deck students are going to be able to get a little bit more ship handling and, and familiarization with operating thrusters where, you know, most of that time would be when they're cadet shipping, if they had a vessel they were on or in a simulator. Now we're going to be able to do it, you know, firsthand in the ocean, real world time. So, you know, how 
how is this ship difference from the ships you sailed in the past? And can you discuss the process you and your team have gone through or are going through to get yourselves ready to sail on this ship safely and efficiently? Right. So, uh, you know, the biggest difference is because it's brand new is the modern construction that's being done and, and all the all the codes is now being built to. Um, ironically, from working on the, the deep water drill ships, which were, you know, a lot of the structure is very similar. You know, the forward house and the propulsion, the diesel electric. So there, there are parts of the ship where I walk on and it reminds me very much of a, of a, a drill ship. So that familiarity is great um, as far as that goes. Training wise, you, you know, we've been going through uh, GE power management training. Uh, my engineers have gone out to um, uh, Wabtec training school. Well, you know, Marad was was very good about funding, getting a lot of training, you know, involved for us. So that that was that was great uh, bridge familiarization. Um, along with that, we've been the, the SUNY team has been here in the yard since December. You know, so we've been down on the ship. We've been observing, uh, testing and commissioning, which was a, it was a great opportunity to to really start seeing how things were coming together. And, you know, as systems were coming online. If you're right there in the beginning, you get you, you get a lot of knowledge just by watching the, the technicians put everything online. So that, that was been great. Uh, we also participated in sea trials uh, about two weeks ago, which was fantastic. So we've been, that's how we've been really getting prepared for it. It's immersing ourselves in design review and, and reviewing the, the blueprints, going over the ops manuals, the tech manuals for all the equipment. You know, we've been just deep diving into all of that and, and working through those. And that's been a great process to, to get us ready for it. You know. I'm sure that the list is long, but when you compare this ship to the one cur currently being sailed, which, if I'm correct, was built in 1961, can you put in perspective how this new ship will enable you and your team to better teach the cadets for a career in the maritime industry? Well, I mean, first thing is it's it's 60 years younger, <laughs> you know. It's so it's it, it's you know you think about what has changed in ship construction design in 60 years and. And that's what we're leap we're leaping into right now with with the new ship. Um, the biggest thing is it's built from the ground up to be a training ship. It's not a cargo ship that was converted. It's not saying, okay, well, here's the space we have. We're going to try to make it work. It's you know the designers built it from the ground up. So a classroom is a classroom. I mean, if I was to drop you in a classroom and you opened your eyes, you wouldn't know you were on a ship right away because it looks like a classroom. It's great. Um, the living spaces, you know, adjusting those. I mean, I did my mug cruise on on the Empire State Five, which was before the the last ship. You know, we had pipe racks and in the in the cargo hold, and that's our birthing area. You know, now you go to the, the Empire State Six was a little bit better with with you know aluminum racks or, or metal frame racks and air conditioning, and now you go to this ship, the living accommodations are a little better. So, and I think that that plays into a big a big change with as our generations have gone through about what is okay for living standards, right? So that's a big part of it. Um, the design of the ship is conducive to meeting spaces for interacting, conference rooms, uh, larger classrooms with chart tables. There's just more space. You know, the ship is is just about, it's a little bit shorter than the, the uh, Empire State 6, but this ship is beamier. So they've used the, the, the beam to, to, it's just a ma the amount of space is amazing on it. And that's going to be a big thing that changes it. The other thing is the technology. You know, we, we're going to have simulator rooms on board. So besides those cadets doing their regular watches and work, they're going to have time where they can do simulations. You know, we dedicated simulator rooms that are, are going to be set up, whether it's ship handling simulators or, you know, um, automation simulators or high voltage simulators for the engineers. So this is what's going to make the big difference. The other thing that's the big difference is with the dual bridge and the dual engine room is you can manage more students safely for training. You know, you can have dedicated supervision that doesn't interfere with the operations, but you could also have that blend where the cadets are involved in the operations, but it's in a very controlled environment. So, you know, with that design, we were able to get that um, out of it, which is fantastic. You know, the, uh, the engine, an engine instructor can be in the offline ECR reviewing everything that's going on in the online ECR, you know, with a, a whole class. And it's just, it's going to, it's going to really help transfer knowledge. Uh, so using your career from your first uh, day as a cadet uh, to SUNY Maritime today, can I get a bit of your perspective on just the evolution of maritime training? You know, you just talked about the simulator rooms and all of the space that has been purpose built. But when you look at maritime training from using the, that time frame as a bookends 
how is it the most same and how is it uh, most different? Yeah, so I, I think that the one part of the training that's different that I that I noticed and I've talked about it with colleagues is, you know, the way work is done, you know, the way we teach cadets how to do maintenance and repair or work on equipment. And, and that's a, that's because of safety management coming into play over the years. So, you know, when when I was a cadet and this it wasn't it wasn't dangerous, it's just the way it was in, in you know, I, in 1989, you, you know, you use cotton for ear protection, you know, you, or you had a waist belt for fall protection. You didn't have a full harness, you know, things were a little, it, it was just, that was the, that was the level of risk that was okay. And, and as the systems have matured through the industry, you know, that's part of what we're teaching cadets now too, is how to manage a safety management system, how to, how to do, you know, stop work authority, how to do a job safety analysis or, or those, those items. And those are things that they're going to see out in industry. So I, I think that's the biggest part. The standing of a watch is still the same. We're still teaching them how to monitor and how to, you know, you scan your instruments. You don't get focused on one thing. You don't focus your whole attention on the radar. You have to look at the ectus and you still do a paper plot chart. You know, the engineers, as much as the automation is that we talked about earlier in the engine room, you know, the, the chief engineer is still going to demand the engine cadets go out and get manual readings and know how to do manual soundings. And, you know, I, I always go back, we, we talk about past experience. I can remember saying chief mate and the cargo max program on the ship I was on died. And we had to do everything longhand for, for stability. I and mean, it was a car carrier. So, you know, it was like, okay, I got to dust off all the math and everything. But, you know, we, we, we factor that in when we're teaching. I mean, the one thing when I first started sailing is, you didn't trust the equipment. You, you didn't trust the equipment because the hardware didn't have the um, redundancy or the robustness to work. Now you don't trust the software because of spoofing and cyber attacks. So because of that, we're still teaching the cadets how to do things the traditional way as their backup. And um, I was thinking about, you know, we talk about electronic navigation. The cadets love staring at the, the magic glass, right? That's the generation. It's okay. We all do. We got our phones all over the place. You know, we're always reminding them that the smart class is looking out the window because that's engaging your brain and your eyes. So at the same time, though, I'll get up in the morning on the training cruise and there'll be 60 cadets out shooting morning stars. And there they are using a sextant, which has been in use for 300 years. And they love it. You know, so you, you get I think we're at a great point where we still get to blend both. You know, we get to teach them how to do things traditionally. But this ship's going to keep us moving forward and modernizing how we educate embellish a little bit more what I was saying earlier, you know, it's about letting the cadets know it's a tool and not to be dependent on it. You know, the, the technology is a tool to make your job easier, to make your job more efficient, to make the ship operate more efficient or safely, but it's just a tool. And sometimes your tool breaks. So you, like, you, like I said, you need to know how to do things another way. Um, I, I think we try to do that by teaching them both ways, you know, so they, they have the technology of the Ectus, but we still make them do a paper plot on the chart, you know, and those are, those are the things. So it's, it's more of teach the traditional methods, explain why they need to know how to do it this way. And, you know, like I said earlier, it's because now we're worried about cyber. So, you know, years ago when I first, you know, when GPS was starting to come on ships, you were worried about the actual GPS unit failing. Not now, the GPS unit's so great, it's never going to fail, but the software is what you worry about now. So, you know, it's, it's one of those things. It's, um, you know, trust but verify is, is more of our, in my philosophy anyway, with the students. Um, we'll just get back on the ship for a bit. So where exactly is the ship today and what needs to be done between now and the time that it's ready and loaded to sail with its first uh, time with the cadets on board? And when is that scheduled to happen? So the, uh, the ship is back from sea trials. Uh, they're, you know, down here in the yard. Uh, the yard is going through the remainder of the work that needs to be done to try to hit a target delivery date. Um, hopefully beginning of September, they're, they're, they're targeting delivery of the ship down here in Philly. But that's, again, that's a conversation I'm not involved in. You know, it's one of those things that they're trying to ha hammer out. But they're, they're finishing up. There's a lot of painting going on, a lot of cleaning going on. Final systems are being tuned and groomed. Uh, you know, the, the deficiency list from sea trials, uh, which... They're, you know, the yard's working through that of those items. Uh, sea trials are very successful, though. I mean, the ship performed great on sea trials. It was very impressive. Um, as an observer, I was very impressed with how the ship handled on sea trials. So it was, it was great to see. Um, as far as training crews, the first training crews will be this winter. We'll do a mini cruise in January. You know, because of the ship being delayed through the summer, we had to put our students out on 
you know, our first class students went on the training ship Kennedy with Texas's crews. And then our second and third class students wound up going on the Golden Bear. When Cal Maritime returned from their cruise, uh, Marid was, was very helpful in, in setting us up to use the Golden Bear. And uh, our SUNY staff went out there on the Golden Bear and we put our second and third class students out there. So they're going to need, they're going to be short some time when they get back. So to get them caught up and to stay on track, we're going to go out for about 25 days over the winter break in January. And uh, we'll, we'll get those second and third class caught up on sea time then. Can you discuss one or two mentors that you have had in your career discussing what they provided to make you a better leader? And at the end of the day, what do you hope that your cadets will take away from you? So I, there's always, you know, the mentor question is always a great one. I always circle back to, um, I worked with, a when I was chief mate, I worked with a uh, Captain Steve Worse uh, at Central Gulf Lines. And working with him, he really taught me by his leadership style and how he managed how to be a good captain. I took a lot away from his style of, of management and leadership, and he was always a good, once I started sailing captain, I was always able to call upon him or email him anytime with questions or advice. And so he's always been a steadfast uh, mentor for me, and I've been very appreciative of that. Um, when I took the role at, at back at the college here, uh, Captain James DeSimone, the former captain of a training ship, uh, he was a great help to me in, on on mentoring me and also just giving me some advice and, you know, working through some issues with that. And then um, when I first started sailing captain, I had a great chief engineer, Neil Riley. He's, he's passed away. Um, Neil was older than I was at the time. I started sailing captain when I was 35. So, you know, young and brash and this and that and all ego. And he just had that great subtle way of just kind of keeping me steady. But, you know, I always say I, I learned how to be a, a captain by working with a really good chief engineer that, you know, it was just good balance. So it was good, good wisdom from him. So those are the three that always come to mind as far as uh, mentors. What I try to pass on to the students is that, you know, never stop learning. Obviously you got to keep learning. Um, be accountable for your actions, be accountable to your mistakes. And it's okay. We're going to make mistakes, you know, make mistakes, learn from the mistake, move on from the mistake, but you know, it's be honest about it too. You know, we always say on the ship, don't try to hide a mistake. It's going to come out eventually, you know? So just, be, you know, be accountable, you know, and, and those are the big things I try to pass on to the students. I think that helps them when they get on their first ship that they know that, you know, as long as they, they keep their integrity of, of being truthful, that the job will go and they'll learn.